Well, for me, it's a particular pleasure to speak to you today because I'm addressing you in personal capacity. Many of you I've come into contact with in official capacity, but this is a very rare opportunity for me um, to take a moment of reflection on the work that I've committed myself to and my colleagues have committed themselves to and some of the inconsistencies that lie kind of deeper in the system that sometimes in our official capacities, we don't necessarily have the skills or the personal resources or the time to reflect on what it is that we think we need to feed ourselves as we address those inconsistencies. So um, in, in this regard, I've got two inconsistencies that I wanted to address. The first one was that in order to be more willing to pay for ecosystem services, you have to earn more. And to earn more, that's predicated on a certain level of economic growth in your area. And traditional mindset has said that that, that economic growth is predicated on economic throughput of material, energy, resources, and the production of waste. All of those things affect our ecosystem service systems, which then lead them to become more scarce, and then we need to pay more to preserve them. So I have to say that I've been really perplexed by that system, and I can't figure out why I keep working within that system and why I can't bust out of it. The other thing that has been really perplexing to me is that we just revised world population estimates for 2000, 2011 to be up from 9 billion people to 10 billion people. And we kind of shrug and we think, well, we'll be gone by then. What's the big deal? 1 billion people with respect to all of our development goals for the future is massive. And the fact that we're not committing our full extent of our resources toward that forward trajectory in a systems-based way is a major inconsistency and it's a major error. Currently, we have 7 billion people on the planet. Half of them are under the age of 25. Those 25-year-olds and under are all checking out of our systems because we've talked about them in the past as being too big to fail. Banking systems healthcare systems, pension systems, planetary life support systems in the past, up until now, we've talked about as being a system too big to fail. Yet, all of our statistics and future trajectories are showing that actually those systems, when we look forward to 2100, they're not too big to fail. And we're concerned about that. We don't have a way to open up discussion about what that is because we can't figure out a way to envision what economic activity and productivity and well-being looks like if it's not tightly tied to our, to our consumption systems that we deeply, personally, are so addicted to. So um, with that, uh, Generally, I talk about ecosystem services being this flow of nature's interest, this writhing, living capital on the planet that gives us um, a fixed amount of natural capital or ecosystem services per year. And when we compare that, this is an image from the Global Footprint Network, to the, um, the footprint, the quantified amount that each of us individually is using in terms of ecosystem services, when we compare the two, we can see that we are out consuming the annual available level of natural capital and nature's interests per year. That is to say, we are outliving our balance sheet. If we look at nature's interest minus our footprint, that leads to our ecological surplus or debt. Here's a map. Green is surplus. This is, again, from the Global Footprint Network of 1961. Um, red is debt. This is 2005. Again, demonstrating the trends of growing um, consumption systems against those that we have to produce it. And Statistically speaking, when we look at all of the articles written about the work on ecosystem services, we talk about ecosystem services supply. We talk about paying more for that supply. We don't talk about the ways in which we consume ecosystem services or the financially smart ways we can talk about influencing that. The, ma the massive problem with this is, is that culture 
eat strategy for breakfast. We are strategizing about providing more ecosystem services, whereas our culture is to always consume more. This is a, a screenshot of the Bank of Natural Capital, and one of the things I do in my personal capacity and currently volunteering as a moderator on Teeb for me is the Twitter feed for Teeb and also the Facebook uh, page. Bank of Natural Capital is not a real bank. There's not money flowing around in there, but it's a place where people can exchange ideas. Currently, it's an infrastructure, and it's a place where we have a lot of hope for facilitating dialogue on exactly this concept. So quickly, there are 10 words that I think are revolutionary with respect to the green economy. Ban Ki-moon talked about the need for a green economy revolution. And we don't talk about revolution because we're scared of that word. The first revolutionary word, especially for the younger mindset that I've been talking to through Team For Me, is I, the I generation. iPod, I, I, I will. Everyone's posting their statuses on Facebook talking about themselves, but the thing is, if we are going to reform our consumption systems, we must look deeply inwardly. And I also stands for IPAT, this equation of impact equals population times affluence times technology. Um, we think about uh, the way we are going to be improving well-being, and this is uh, a screenshot from Loxi. It's a little camera that you can go around in virtual reality. It's about $200, and you can record and share with other people your experiences out in the world. And so the, the idea here is that for many of the younger generation, experience is the new currency. It's no longer necessarily about all of the material things you have. It's about the experiences you have access to and how you can share that with others. That's a major <coughs> leverage point with respect to reducing the throughput that we're dependent on in creating economic activity and productivity. The second power word is seed. Seeds are one of the most powerful evolutionary forces in the world. How we have, hold them, how we cherish them, how we think about them, how we place and invest in them is a deeply important, powerful concept. And in terms of how we seed the future generation, if we look on the right, this is developing world, and on the left is um, developed countries. In developed countries, we have to consider that currently in an average American child will spend about six hours in front of the, the computer or internet and about four, less than four um, minutes of unstructured play outdoors per day. This is a map of all of the Team For Me um, members and there's currently about four between four and five thousand on various channels they are tweeting in 19 languages they're from 67 countries and we have sometimes p uh, peak post visitations at about uh, 5500 per day um, this is seeding for a future generation a way in which ideas and and, and uh, information can be exchanged and also as we seed these channels of communication they can grow they can evolve and we can invest in them conscientiously in order to be able to build the communication structures that we need to talk about a lot of these issues feeding uh, this is again uh, another map of the exchange of information among our various internet channels and uh, the black is Facebook, red are different um, Orkut and, uh, and a number of other uh, social media channels in which information is being um, exchanged. Feeding is important here because there's a regular feed of information and I'm not just talking about the internet being the opiate of the masses. What I'm talking about here is right underneath our feet, there is a massive global conscious network that is growing and is allowing us to exchange not just information, but it's allowing us to become more concerned and care about people that are much more different from us, have different experiences from us, and are physically located much further away from us than ever before with less contact. 
This is really important in addressing the major development gaps we have between rich and poor, north and south, those that have access to the internet and those that not. The internet here, one thing to remember is that these social networks are forming outside of also computer use. We have, a, a, for example, Indonesia is the world's fourth largest country and it also is the, um, the fourth largest consumer of Twitter. So we can play around with these things like geocaching or ecotopia. We can reset the way in which we're thinking about cons material consumerism. This is mindset. You can wear a little headset which tracks your brain waves and will give you a visual output. So you can be walking around in a department store and you can decide why you have that impulse to buy something. You can study that not only in yourself, but for other people. And think about that in terms of the power in which we are investing both in our marketing systems, but also in the way in which we are helping our children make better decisions for their future. The mesh. It's no longer necessary to own something personally. We can now share them. We can share cars, we can share bicycles, the, the handbags in Japan, you can rent one, you can become a member of a social group, you can rent the handbag and then pass it on. This is no longer a, a matter of, um, of material necessity to own it forever, but it means that it's no longer being produced just to be disposable. And this allows us to change our production system. Snapping. This is leaf snap. You can take your iPhone and you can, or your personal technology device, and you can snap an uh, outline of a leaf. And that your personal technology device will identify the leaf for you by species. You can have it listen to a bird call, and it can identify the species of bird in the forest by the call. Um, on the right is every trail. You can bring it out on the trail with you. What if we had people geolocating and it would tell you how many people were drinking the water that was flowing on the stream underneath your feet in a park? What if you were able to scan the tree next to you and find out how many tons of carbon it was sequestering per year? So this is Lara Barbier, Ed Barbier's daughter, with me in the Botanical Garden yesterday. This is the QR code. Some of you have seen this. You are going to become very familiar with this particular object in the future. You can put QR codes on stickers. You can put them on products. You can embed them in a log in a forest, send it to a, an agency, have it turned into a door. That QR code can be d embedded at the point of purchase and a consumer can snap a picture with their personal technology and be able to see a video that pops up of the family that harvested that particular log from that exact forest. And you can talk about the financial systems that can evolve and be strengthened because of that flow of information and the immediacy with which a consumer is able to make choices that are very consonant with their personal values. Um, so this is illustrating that particular chain in Vietnam. Uh, dig. We need to dig deeper into our different consumption systems. This is an uh, illustration from the story of stuff, which many of you are familiar with. And it changes the way in which we sell, consume, invest, produce, but mainly plan. And this room has a very high capacity for planning for the future with many of these systems that we're talking about. I'm going to skip this. Cloud. This is the granny cloud. One of the, one of the most powerful forces in the world right now with respect to all of our ecosystem service goals is girls, adolescent girls. There is a, a project right now called the Granny Cloud, which has um, British uh, women reading stories over Skype to children in the developing world. A girl who receives seven years of school will marry seven years later, or will marry four years later, will have 2.2 fewer children, will earn 10 to 5, 5, between 15 to 25% more, and women, when they earn that income in developing countries, spend 90% of that income on their families, not on conspicuous consumption systems, which is different than a boy following those same processes spends about 30 to 40% on his family. Girls are extremely powerful, and learning to read is critical to it. A scene and the senius that we have. So by senius, I mean the genius we have about being on the scene. 
And this is um, a Wordle that I posted on Team for Me this morning um, based on the brainstorm that we did for this forum. And I asked everyone to send me all of their most revolutionary words that they could think of with respect to the green economy. And this is what we came up with, and you can check it out. So the last power word is to share. Um, here are some different ways in which we can be in touch, either through the Twitter feed or Facebook or from the Bank of Natural Capital. But I look forward to talking about all of these things with you in the next, next few days. Thank you.